الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of all that happens in the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time my dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The month of Dhul Qa'dah has just started and what this means is that the time of Hajj is getting nearer by the day. Now there might be some of you who are going for Hajj this year and others who might have been already and others who have never been but we hope and pray that you have the intention and the desire inshallah and perhaps some plans to go soon and so since these are the days before hajj i know on a practical level in terms of deciding now to go for hajj this year it might be too late most groups if not all the groups have already been booked and uh, people have been uh, sending in the documents for visas and so on but nevertheless, I hope that our discussion today and in the subsequent days to come before Hajj will inshallah help those who haven't performed Hajj yet perhaps make some sort of firm resolve to make plans and to work towards those plans in terms of performing Hajj. As we all know, it is one of the, the pillars of Islam and as, a, as, as such, the fact that it is a pillar of Islam highlights its value and its importance in the expression of being Muslim. Right? The pillars of Islam are the core expression of the Muslim. These are not the only things, of course, that Muslims require to, to, to do or to live by. But nevertheless, these form the basis or the foundations of Islam. So it is a pillar of Islam and so every Muslim should strive and should make plans regarding this pillar of Islam. Of course, it is not as easy for many people to perform Hajj as it is for all of us to do, to do the other pillars like prayers and fasting and so on. And Allah the Exalted in His infinite knowledge and wisdom knew of course that it would be difficult. And so, when he ordered us to perform Hajj, he stipulated that command with a condition or a requirement. And that is the ability to perform Hajj. And mankind owes a, owe a duty to Allah to visit the house. And the visit here means Hajj. But Allah qualifies that by saying man istata'a ilayhi sabila for those who can afford to undertake this journey. And so with this requirement to this condition Allah the exalted has made it easy upon people who may not have the financial resources and who may also have other excuses because this istata'a this ability to perform hajj is not exclusive to financial, to being financially able to perform Hajj. It also includes the health of the individual. You might have the finances, you might not be in good health. So it includes the health of the individual. It also includes the dependence of that individual or those individuals. If the, if the husband and wife are going for Hajj, it also includes the dependence of these individuals uh, in terms of whether they have good family or even friends to leave their children with and that they would have peace of mind that the children will be okay and will be well looked after in their absence but nevertheless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
made it easy upon people in that it is only obligatory on those who have the financial means and, and they're in good health and so on to perform Hajj. And so this is one example of the fact that Allah the Exalted did not impose upon us in Islam and in terms of the legislation in Islam on due or unnecessary hardships. And I don't say hardships, but I qualify that by saying on due or unnecessary. Because there are some hardships that are associated with everything. With salah, in as much as it costs us no money per se to, uh, to pray, and there is no particular journey we have to undertake, it still involves some amount of hardship. So it takes some sacrifice and some commitment. Zakat, of course, you have to part with your wealth. Fasting, it has its hardships. No eating and drinking from dawn until sunset. And on the days that are long and when the temperature is hot, it is, it has difficulty. So it is unnecessary hardships and on, on due hardships that Allah has not imposed upon us. But in the performance of our duties and obligations as Muslims, we will enc encounter some level of difficulty, but not uh, overburdening difficulty or unnecessary burden on the person. Now, brothers and sisters, having said that, all of us as Muslims, we need to, to, to think about the objective, not only behind Hajj, but every other obligation in Islam. We should also think deeply about and ponder the objective, the ultimate goal of the institution of these pillars or these obligations. For Allah the Exalted did not order anything except with, for, for a reason, for a purpose. And likewise, He did not prohibit anything except that there is a good reason for that. Allah has told us in the Qur'an that He is, he is exalted. He is far removed from doing anything without purpose, without aim, without objective. So, from this we know with certainty as Muslims that everything that Allah has ordered or prohibited, there is a hadaf, there is a goal behind it, an objective behind it. Now I must say at this point in time, as Muslims, our worship of Allah and our submission to Allah is based not on our understanding of the wisdom or the objective of a particular legislation or command. Our worship of Allah is based on, on, on su su submission and surrender to Allah, regardless of whether we understand the wisdom behind a particular order or not. But that does not limit us or inhibit us or should not inhibit us from seeking to understand why. What is in it for us? What does Allah want us to achieve from this? Because seeking to understand why, brothers and sisters, inshaAllah will bring us greater peace of mind. Greater peace of mind. We believe, alhamdulillah, and we submit. But there is a greater peace of mind that we can achieve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, an incident that occurred in his life. When he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said to him, O Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى And remember when Ibrahim alayhi salam said, My Lord, show me how you give life to the dead. This is, the, this is uh, the human mind, the curiosity of the human mind. How exactly does this work? How exactly you give life to the dead? And Allah the Exalted said to him, Qala awalam tu'min. Allah said to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Don't you believe, that is, don't you believe I can give life to the dead? I can make a person who is dead come alive again? Don't you believe that? <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salam responded by saying, 
Qala bala. He says, sure, I believe, O Lord. Walakin liyatma'inna qalbi. However, I'm just looking for this inner peace or this greater peace of mind. The contentment of the heart. Because being told about something is one thing, but actually seeing it with your own eyes is something else. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, of course, believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he did not had he did not have any doubts about Allah's uh, uh, ability and power to give life to the dead. But he said, لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِ I want this greater peace of mind. And Allah the Exalted did not reprimand him. This is, this is key here. He did not reprimand him for asking for this greater peace of mind. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to do certain uh, something that showed him or, or gave him that peace of mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to take uh, a four birds and to kill these birds, to slaughter them, and to cut them up in little pieces, and to mix up the meat, and then to take uh, uh, pieces of the meat, or handfuls of the meat, and put it on various mountains in Mecca. قَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِنَ الطَّيْرِ فَصُرْهُنَّ إِلَيْكَ ثُمَّ جَعَلْ عَلَى كُلِّ جَبَلٍ مِنْهُنَّ جُزْءًا Allah said to him, take four birds, slaughter them, cut them up into pieces, mix up the meat. And then take just handfuls of the meat and put it on the various mountains. Then call these birds to you, they will come walking. And Allah tells him, no, with certainty, beyond any doubt, be convinced. That Allah is Aziz, He is Almighty, He has power over all things, and Hakim, He is wise. So, looking for greater peace of mind is, 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 is not uh, something that, is, uh, that should be looked at in a negative way in Islam. But we have to be careful, like I said, understanding why should not be the reason why we worship Allah. So that if we don't understand why, we refuse to do so. The basis on which we worship Allah is total submission, surrender to His commands. But understanding why, inshaAllah will bring us greater peace of mind and will, will, will contribute towards the individual being willing, being willing to make even greater sacrifices. To make even greater sacrifices. And this is why the Sahaba, I mean, it is not necessarily impossible for any generation of Muslims after them to come close to achieving what they achieved. But one of the things that they had that we don't have and we won't have is the fact that they were able, they, they lived with the Prophet ﷺ and they witnessed certain things. They witnessed certain things that would, have, that would bring a person a greater level of conviction than the person who simply has to hear about these things. Although we don't doubt them. So, we need to spend some time to think about why are we doing this? Because like I said, if we can understand why, inshaAllah, it will inspire us to be even more diligent in worshipping Allah. To work and strive even harder in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But since this is the hat season, we need to think about the purpose of Hajj. What is the objective of the institution of Hajj? Is it merely for people to leave their homes and their families and travel to Mecca, perform certain rituals, going from this place to that place at, at specific times, and then coming back and that's it? Or is it more than that? 
The answer, of course, is that it is more than this. And I believe, and Allah knows best, the essence of Hajj lies in the story that, or the event that unfolded in the life of Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as -salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Ibrahim to, to sacrifice Ismail. Now Hajj we know, all of Hajj is not simply limited to this one event, but this event in the life of Ibrahim, the sacrifice, plays or is an important part of Hajj. So if we go back to this story, and we ask ourselves, what is the objective behind this order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why did he order Ibrahim to slaughter his son, to sacrifice his son? What did he want from Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam? You read the whole story in the Quran, because the end part of the story actually gives us the insight and the understanding of the objective behind this order. Now, of course, at the beginning, when Ibrahim السلام, was given this order, he had no clue what Allah's objective was, what Allah wanted him to prove or to demonstrate. Because if he knew that, then of course, there would you know, there'd be no uh, uh, meaning to the order. But at the end, Ibrahim السلام, understood what Allah's, what the objective was. But even without knowing the objective, subhanAllah, he actually fulfilled that objective. And this is why he and his family, alayhim salam, Allah has used them extensively in the Quran as a model, as a role model for, for us as Muslims. And even for other nations. Ibrahim alayhi salam, the level of submission and surrender of he and his family members, this is a, a shining model for all people. Inshallah, I'll stop here because I know we're kind of out of time. Right? We don't want to make this into a long lecture. But inshallah, when we meet again, we'll continue with the story. And we'll look at it in some details to understand that there was a certain objective behind this order. And that Ibrahim alayhi salam fulfilled this objective. And Ismail alayhi salam. And on top of that, what Allah teaches us as well in this story and in other stories is that when this objective is fulfilled, when people surrender and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who provides ease and a way out of the difficulties that people face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can comprehend this great message that He has revealed for mankind. And may He inspire all of us to live by this message. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته